Uh, good morning. Earlier today, the Department of Justice, joined by 15 states and the District of Columbia, sued Apple in the U.S. District Court for the District of New Jersey for violating Section 2 of the Sherman Antitrust Act. Over the last two decades, Apple has become one of the most valuable public companies in the world. Today, its net income exceeds the individual gross domestic product of more than 100 countries. That is in large part due to the success of the iPhone, Apple's signature smartphone product. For over a decade, iPhone sales have made up a majority of Apple's annual revenue. Today, Apple's share of the U.S. performance smartphone market exceeds 70 percent, and its share of the entire U.S. smartphone market exceeds 65 percent. Apple charges as much as nearly $1,600 for an iPhone. But as our complaint alleges, Apple has maintained monopoly power in the smartphone market not simply by staying ahead of the competition on the merits, but by violating federal antitrust law. Consumers should not have to pay higher prices because companies break the law. We allege that Apple has employed a strategy that relies on exclusionary, anti-competitive conduct that hurts both consumers and developers. For consumers, that has meant fewer choices, higher prices and fees, lower quality smartphones, apps and accessories, and less innovation from Apple and its competitors. For developers, that has meant being forced to play by rules that insulate Apple from competition. And as outlined in our complaint, we allege that Apple has consolidated its monopoly power not by making its own products better, but by making other products worse. Apple carries out its exclusionary anti-competitive conduct in two principal ways. First, Apple imposes contractual restrictions and fees that limit the features and functionality that developers can offer iPhone users. Second, Apple selectively restricts access to the points of connection between third-party apps and the iPhone's operating system, degrading the functionality of non-Apple apps and accessories. As a result, for most of the past 15 years, Apple has collected a tax in the form of a 30% commission on the price of any app downloaded from the App Store, as well as on in-app purchases. Apple is able to command these fees from companies of all sizes. Apple has also suppressed the emergence of programs like cloud streaming apps, including gaming apps, as well as super apps that could reduce user dependence on Apple's own operating system and expensive hardware. And as any iPhone user who has ever seen a green text message or received a tiny, grainy video can attest, Apple's anti-competitive conduct also includes making it more difficult for iPhone users to message with users of non-Apple products. It does this by diminishing the functionality of its own messaging app and by diminishing the functionality of third-party messaging apps. By doing so, Apple knowingly and deliberately degrades quality, privacy, and security for its users. For example, if an iPhone user messages a non-iPhone user in Apple Messages, the text appears not only as a green bubble, but incorporates limited functionality. The conversation is not encrypted, videos are pixelated and grainy, and users cannot edit messages or see typing indicators. As a result, iPhone users perceive rival smartphones as being lower quality because the experience of messaging friends and family who do not own iPhones is worse, even though Apple is the one responsible for breaking cross-platform messaging. And it does so intentionally. For example, in 2013, a senior executive at Apple explained that supporting cross-platform messaging in Apple Messages, quote, would simply serve to remove an obstacle to iPhone families giving their kids Android phones, close quote. In 2022, Apple's CEO was asked whether Apple would fix iPhone to Android messaging. The questionnaire added, quote, not to make it personal, but I can't send my mom certain videos, close quote. Apple's CEO responded, buy your mom an iPhone. 
In addition to selectively controlling app distribution and creation, we allege that Apple is violating the law by conditionally restricting developers' access to the interface, which is needed to make an app functional on the Apple operating system. For a product like a smartwatch or a digital wallet to be useful to an iPhone user, it must be able to communicate with the iPhone's operating system. But Apple creates barriers that make it extremely difficult and expensive for both users and developers to venture outside the Apple ecosystem. When it comes to smartwatches, Apple not only drives users to purchase an Apple Watch, which is only compatible with an iPhone, it also uses its technical and contractual controls to make it harder for someone with an iPhone to use a non-Apple smartwatch. And when it comes to digital wallets, Apple's exclusionary conduct goes a step further. Digital wallets allow users to store and use passes and credentials in a single app, including credit cards, personal identification, movie tickets, and car keys. Apple Wallet is Apple's proprietary digital wallet on the iPhone. Apple actively encourages banks, merchants, and other parties to participate in Apple Wallet, but it simultaneously exerts its monopoly power to block these same partners from developing alternative payment products and services for iPhone users. For example, Apple has blocked third-party developers from creating competing digital wallets on the iPhone that use what is known as tap-to-pay functionality. That is the function that makes a digital wallet, well, a wallet. Instead, Apple forces those who want to use the wallet function to share personal information with Apple, even if they would prefer to share that information solely with their bank, medical provider, or other trusted third party. When an iPhone user puts a credit or debit card in an Apple wallet, Apple inserts itself into the process that would otherwise occur directly between the user and the card issuer. This introduces an additional potential point of failure for the privacy and security of Apple users. And that is just one way in which Apple is willing to make the iPhone less secure and less private in order to maintain its monopoly power. The Supreme Court defines monopoly power as, quote, the power to control prices or exclude competition. As set out in our complaint, Apple has that power in the smartphone market. Now, having monopoly power does not itself violate the antitrust laws, but it does when a firm acquires or maintains monopoly power, not because it has a superior product or superior business acumen, but by engaging in exclusionary conduct. As set out in our complaint, Apple has maintained its power not because of its superiority, because of its unlawful exclusionary behavior. Monopolies like Apple's threaten the free and fair markets upon which our economy is based. They stifle innovation, they hurt producers and workers, and they increase costs for consumers. If left unchallenged, Apple will only continue to strengthen its smartphone monopoly. But there's a law for that. The Justice Department will vigorously enforce antitrust law. Enforcing the law protects consumers from higher prices and fewer choices. That is the Justice Department's legal obligation. That is what the American people expect. That is what they deserve. I am grateful to the attorneys and staff of the Department's Antitrust Division for their tireless work on this case on behalf of the American people. I'll now turn the podium over to the Deputy Attorney General. Thank you very much, Mr. Attorney General, and good morning, everyone. In our fight against corporate misconduct, the Department's approach is straightforward and relentless. We identify the most serious wrongdoers, whether individuals or companies, and then we focus our full energy and devote all necessary resources to holding them accountable. Accountability promotes fairness, it drives deterrence, and it advances the rule of law. By holding all companies to the same standards, our approach to corporate enforcement benefits 
all Americans, Americans who deserve and who demand a justice system that holds accountable those who break the law. For over a century, our federal antitrust laws have been a critical tool for protecting competition, the competition that fuels and drives our nation's economy. These laws protect consumer choice in the market, they keep prices in check, they promote quality, and they open doors to innovation. Today, the department alleges that Apple, one of the world's largest tech companies, crossed the line from rigorous competition to anti-competitive exclusion, unlawfully maintaining a monopoly in violation of the Sherman Act. The complaint makes clear that for years, Apple has tightened its grip on the smartphone market. It has done so, not through product improvements, but by maintaining a chokehold on competition, locking its customers in to the iPhone while locking its competitors out of the market. As a result, and as the complaint details, Apple has gone from revolutionizing the smartphone market to stalling its advancement. This shift has smothered an entire industry, from users to app developers to the next generation of innovators. Apple's anti-competitive conduct must stop. 16 other attorneys general agree and have joined us in bringing this lawsuit against Apple. I want to thank the women and the men of the antitrust division for their commitment to promoting competition and protecting consumers and workers in all of their work. And I want to thank Assistant Attorney General Cantor for his leadership. Their work makes clear that no matter how powerful, no matter how prominent, no matter how popular, no company is above the law. Through today's action, we reaffirm our unwavering commitment to this principle. And with that, I'll hand it off to the Acting Associate Attorney General, Ben Miser. Thank you, Deputy Attorney General Monaco. And I want to echo the Attorney General's and the Deputy Attorney General's thanks to the leadership and staff of the Antitrust Division for all their extraordinary work in promoting competition and advancing economic opportunity. The landmark Microsoft case held a monopolist liable under the antitrust laws for leveraging its market position to undermine technologies that would have made it easier for users to choose different computer operating systems. Today's complaint alleges that Apple has engaged in many of the same tactics that Microsoft used. The complaint describes how Apple's anti-competitive conduct discourages developers from offering new and innovative applications and makes it more difficult for consumers to switch to other smartphones. Apple's conduct leaves consumers with higher prices, fewer new products, and a worse user experience. In this way, today's complaint also reflects the broader importance of vigorous antitrust enforcement. Markets that lack competition shift power from consumers and workers to powerful corporations. A lack of competition means fewer choices and higher prices for consumers. It means fewer options and lower wages for workers. And it means that the owners of powerful corporations make more without expanding the size of the pie for anyone else. Promoting competition through antitrust enforcement levels that playing field and is critical to promoting economic opportunity and equity. The, the department has been and remains committed to pursuing these goals wherever anti-competitive conduct arises. In the airline industry, we have successfully challenged mergers that would lead to higher ticket prices and fewer flight options for travelers. Earlier this month, JetBlue and Spirit announced that they were abandoning their proposed merger, a major victory for Americans who rely on competition between airlines to travel affordably. We have also weighed in on important cases affecting how much American families pay for housing, explaining why it is unlawful for landlords to collude to raise rental prices even when AI technology is used to do that. 
and we have prioritized criminal antitrust enforcement, cracking down on bid rigging and procurement fraud schemes that victimize federal, state, and local governments, and ultimately, taxpayers. These are just a few recent examples of the work that the Antitrust Division and the department more broadly has done to ensure that the American people have equal opportunity in the marketplace. Today's suit against Apple ref reflects our continued commitment to promoting competition and advancing economic justice. I'll now turn it over to Assistant Attorney General Jonathan Cantor. Good morning. Thank you, Attorney General Garland, Deputy Attorney General Monaco, Acting Associate Attorney General Miser, and a special welcome to the New Jersey, New Jersey Attorney General Placken. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Principal Deputy uh, for the Antitrust Division, Doha Meki, uh, Deputy, uh, Deputy Assistant Attorney General Hedel Doshi, and Deputy Assistant General Michael Kiedis. The Department of Justice has an enduring legacy of taking on the biggest and toughest monopolies in history. This includes historic cases against Standard Oil, AT&T, and Microsoft. Today, we add to that distinguished legacy by announcing an antitrust lawsuit against Apple for monopolizing smartphones. Approximately 25 years ago, the Department of Justice and State Attorneys General announced a case against a different platform monopolist. That successful litigation and remedy created opportunities for the next generation of technologies, including and especially Apple. 25 years ago, it would have been difficult to imagine the innovation that would follow from the proliferation of mobile devices and services. That historic antitrust case, however, played a pivotal role in ushering the next generation of technologies. Apple itself was a significant beneficiary of that case. And the remedy paved the way for Apple to launch iTunes, iPod, and eventually the iPhone, free from anti-competitive restrictions, excessive fees, and retaliation. Today, we stand here once again to protect competition and innovation for the next generation of technology. Smartphones have so revolutionized American life that it can be hard to imagine a world beyond the one that Apple, a self-interested monopolist, deems, and I quote, good enough, close quote. But under our system of antitrust laws, good enough is quite simply not enough. The law mandates that competition, and not Apple's self-interested business strategies alone, deliver innovation and choice. This is particularly important in areas of the economy that impact our daily lives. And it is hard to think of a product that is more essential to our daily lives than smartphones. Competition does not just protect the markets and technologies of today, but the innovations of tomorrow. We bring this case to make sure that Apple competes by innovating rather than imposing rules and fees that prevent others from innovating and competing too. And in doing so, we protect the market for the innovations that we can't yet perceive. Alongside our colleagues at the State Attorneys General, we have conducted a methodical, thorough, and extensive investigation that has uncovered a pattern of anti-competitive conduct by Apple. Our lawsuit sets forth extensive facts and includes substantial excerpts from Apple's own internal documents. Our lawsuit explains Apple's longstanding pattern of harmful anti-competitive behavior. And Apple has inflicted, using that anti-competitive behavior, anti-competitive harm that is acute and substantial. For example, Apple's conduct has resulted in less competition to lower the price of smartphones for American consumers. Consumers are paying more as a result for digital goods, services, and subscriptions. Smartphone users are losing out on new, innovative, 
and more secure features that can reduce the need for expensive hardware, unlock major technological advances, and allow for more secure communications. Developers, artists, content creators are paying hefty fees as Apple gains more control over the creation and distribution of content. Banks and credit unions are now paying new credit card fees for every tap-to-pay transaction initiated from an iPhone in retail stores and businesses. These fees will cost the economy, the U.S. economy, billions of dollars. Apple has long relied on contractual restrictions rather than competition on the merits to fortify its monopoly power. We know this because Apple's internal documents tell us as much. In 2010, a senior Apple executive emailed the then CEO of Apple about an ad for a new Kindle reader. The ad began with a woman using her iPhone to buy and read books on a Kindle app. She then switches to using an Android smartphone and continues to read her books using the same app. The senior executive Apple at Apple expressed his concerns in candid terms. A, and I quote, message that can't be missed is that it is easy to switch from iPhone to Android. Not fun to watch, close quote. Apple was clear in its response to this competitive threat. Apple would, and I quote, force, close quote, developers into using Apple's payment system. As we allege in our lawsuit, Apple repeatedly responded to competitive threats like this one by making it harder to leave than making it more attractive to stay. The antitrust laws have something to say about that. In closing, I would like to thank the unbelievably hardworking, dedicated, talented, and extremely awesome staff of the Antitrust Division, many of whom are in the back. They are exceptional public servants, and I am so proud every day to call them colleagues. I would also like to thank the Attorneys General and their incredible teams from Arizona, California, Connecticut, District of Columbia, Maine, Michigan, Minnesota, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Oregon, Tennessee, Vermont, and Wisconsin. Finally, I extend our deepest gratitude to the U.S. Attorney and his extraordinary team from the District of New Jersey who join us in filing this important and historic case. It is a great privilege now to turn the podium over to the Attorney General from the great state of New Jersey. Good morning. I'm honored to stand here today alongside Attorney General Garland, Deputy Attorney General Monaco, Acting Associate Attorney General Miser, and Assistant Attorney General Cantor, and the rest of the Department of Justice on behalf of both the 9.3 million residents of the state of New Jersey and a bipartisan group of 16 attorneys general. Because no matter which great state we represent, we are all responsible for protecting the well-being of our residents, and that includes their economic well-being. As we've heard, we're here today because Apple has consistently and deliberately engaged in anti-competitive business practices designed to maximize their profits and profits for their shareholders while minimizing the ability of consumers to switch to a competitor or to otherwise cut their costs. I'd wager that just about everyone in this room and everyone watching this press conference has a smartphone. And nearly seven of every 10 smartphones are iPhones. That's not an accident. Rather than compete on an even playing field, Apple has stifled innovation in order to gain total control of the iPhone software ecosystem. As a result, iPhone users become dependent on Apple and its products and find the process of switching phones exceedingly costly and complex. The company has created a marketplace in which developers, consumers, and others must play, by, play only by rules established by Apple for Apple. In 2016, the company announced that it had sold 1 billion iPhones, a number that continues to climb. When that milestone was reached, 
Apple CEO Tim Cook said iPhones had, quote, become more than a constant companion. The iPhone is truly an essential part of our daily life, end quote. That dependence was no accident. Apple made the iPhone a part of our daily life by limiting the features and functionality that developers could offer iPhone customers and by selectively controlling access between apps and the iPhone operating system. As we note in the complaint, Apple protects its business model by restricting technologies that would make it easier for iPhone customers to switch to another smartphone. Those restrictions go to the core of Apple's unlawful conduct, and the end result is that you pay more money for an inferior product. As New Jersey's Attorney General, it is my responsibility to protect the rights of consumers in my state and ensure that businesses treat them fairly, no matter how large or powerful they are. And that's what my fellow attorneys general do every day on behalf of their residents. Monopolies are the antithesis of our free market economy. They drive up costs and limit options for consumers across our states and across this country. And thanks to the actions like we are taking today alongside our partners in the Department of Justice, we will stop them. Thank you. question about antitrust. Obviously, the Justice Department is suing Google. Federal Trade Commission is suing Amazon and Facebook. What does it say to you? Those are four of the greatest American business success stories of modern history. What does it say to you that they're all accused of illegal, anti-competitive behavior? And if you can indulge me in an off-topic question. Well, I do this antitrust one first, and maybe I'll have more success with that one. I don't know. Uh, look, uh, Justice Department does not have a different rule for the powerful as compared to the powerless, does not have a different rule for the rich as compared to the poor. We have one rule. We look at the facts, we look at the law, we make the appropriate determinations. I will say that with respect to resource allocation, when you have an institu a institution with lots of resources, that in our view is harming the American economy and the American people, it's important for us to allocate our resources to protect the American people. And that is certainly the case where individual Americans have no ability to protect themselves. Thanks. And on the special counsel Robert Hur's report, you personally have come in for a lot of criticism, in particular from the White House, anonymous officials, uh, who say that you should have acted to keep him from characterizing the president's memory the way he did in that report, that you should have stepped in. What's your response to that? I haven't, uh, no one from the White House has said that to me. Um, when the president announced my nomination, he said uh, to me directly and then to the American public that he intended to restore the independence and the integrity of the Justice Department and that he wanted me to serve as the lawyer for the American people, not the lawyer for the president. I sincerely believe that that's what he intended then and I sincerely believe that that's what he intends now. But did you think that that was appropriate, the language that he used to characterize the president's mental state? Look, they, I said from the very beginning that I would make public the report of, the special, of all the special counsels appointed during the period of my service. That is consistent with the regulation, which requires a special counsel to explain what the special counsel's decisions are. It's in, uh, consistent with the president's the full disclosure of all special counsel reports in the entire 25 years in which the regulation has been in effect. It's consistent with the common practice during the previous period of the um, uh, independent counsel statute. Um, the idea uh, that uh, an attorney general would uh, edit or redact or censor the special counsel's explanation for why the special counsel reached the decision that special counsel did, that's absurd. Um, so today's complaint focuses specifically on the iPhone uh, market and smartphone markets. Um, there were reports in recent months saying that potentially the DOJ could also be considering looking at iPads or other parts of uh, Apple's business. So I was curious if you could explain to us why focus specifically on smartphones at this moment in time and whether the DOJ remains open to potentially broaden this challenge against Apple given also the argument that this alleged misconduct actually has ripple, ripple effects across uh, the economy. 
Well, our general practice is not to discuss matters that we have not announced, and so I don't, or whether we're announcing them or not. So I won't answer the latter part of your question. Look, on the first part of the question, I think our complaint explains why we're focused on the iPhone. It's the exclusionary conduct by um, Apple to maintain its monopoly in that area, and it's the consequences for innovation, the prices, uh, and the effect on both consumers, developers, banks, and credit card companies. Uh, I think I'll let Mr. Cantor um, say anything else he wishes to add to that. Thank you, Attorney General. We focus on the core monopoly in this complaint. Apple's core monopoly is in the iPhone. And we focus on the conduct that Apple is engaged in to illegally maintain its monopoly in the iPhone. And that relates to the entire iPhone ecosystem. And we've provided extensive detail about practices across a broad range of services and features throughout the iPhone ecosystem that have contributed to illegally maintaining Apple's monopoly power. Dave, um, Dave Michaels from the Wall Street Journal. Um, the government's not the first plaintiff to accuse Apple of anti-competitive conduct, so could you explain why you think the government is better positioned here to prosecute a successful case, including um, wh why this is a viable case in spite of the fact that Apple mostly beat um, the case that Epic Games filed against Apple? And then um, finally, do you think your lawsuit will ultimately lead to lower fees uh, in the App Store for developers and consumers? Uh, look. The United States normally wins the cases that it brings. Uh, we bring cases because we believe the facts and law justify them, and because we believe that we are likely to win those cases. Now, I'll let Mr. Cantor again explain any further that he'd like. Thank you, Attorney General. Our case, as I mentioned before, focuses on the Apple's core monopoly, which is the iPhone. We have focused on a pattern of conduct that goes back over a decade that Apple is engaged in in order to reinforce its monopoly power by excluding rivals, by excluding technologies, and stifling innovations that would threaten Apple's stranglehold on its monopoly power. The extensiveness and the um, specific specificity in our complaint um, speaks for itself. And I think you will notice that um, it is uh, distinct from cases that have been brought elsewhere, which focus on narrow products and services. Um, thank you, Attorney General. I have a question specifically about the App Store portion of this. Um, there's already a member of Congress this morning in response to this lawsuit saying that if Apple can't vet the apps that are sold on its platform, it opens the door to apps made in China and Russia and, and other adversaries, if you will from getting onto people's phones. How would you respond to that criticism? So I'll just say, in, in general, and, and once again, I'm going to go to Mr. Cantor for the specifics. Uh, this lawsuit is not aimed at every kind of vetting or other activity that Apple does with respect to the App Store. It is aimed at exclusionary conduct. As we've set forth in the complaint, there are many things uh, of that exclusionary conduct that do not help security and in fact, some that actually harm security. So I'm gonna uh, leave it to uh, Mr. Cantor to describe this in more specifics. Thank you, Attorney General. Privacy and security are extremely important values. Competition makes devices and services more private and more secure. Our complaint explains very clearly while the legal exclusionary conduct that Apple is engaged in is not necessary to protect privacy, while the illegal and exclusionary conduct that Apple has engaged in is not necessary to protect security and privacy. Um, our, in fact, as the Attorney General mentioned, our complaint explains that in many instances, Apple's conduct has made its ecosystem less private and less secure. Uh, and that's the first thing I think you're yeah.